It's interesting, you use the word safe quite a lot. Um, um, and I, I'm so interested um, to sort of read in the book uh, uh, of the many things that you question about societies, um, what it tells us a relationship should be like, what it tells us that love should be like. Um, it tells us that love, you know, should be sort of exciting and fireworks. Um, and you really, um, I think, want to get across the message that safe safety is actually the ultimately important thing um you, you know you say safe isn't sexy that's what sort of society shows us but actually you advocate thinking of relationships very differently when it comes to that word safety it's not me it's all of any well-informed psychotherapist because the science proves um, and for those of you who want to know the science, polyvagal theory, th through our evolutionary process, um, we have a dorsal sy system. This is our automatic nervous system. We have a sympathetic system, and then we have a ventral state of connection. And the ventral state is our highest form of evolution. So that means you and me, Hannah, feel safe. We're making eye contact. There's co-regulation. There's a lot of safety in my relationship with you right now. When I feel safe, I can open up. When I feel safe, I feel attuned. I feel in flow with you. If I get an inner cue or an outer cue, I shift from a sense of safety to a sense of fear. And so what happens is if we grew up in a home where there was a lot of sympathetic activation or it was really chaotic, we can meet partners that, and it feels familiar for us. There's a subconscious pull there around and Amago would say that's for us to heal but there's a subconscious pull like this feels familiar there's a charge here um and and so we can end up in these dynamics where we're charged and it feels exciting but really what it's activating is your nervous system and it's really important to understand that that might not be love per se I mean I think good it's good to have fireworks it's normal to fall in love and but if you don't feel safe and you can't reestablish safety and you can't be yourself and you build intimacy slowly, that could just be your trauma saying, wow, this feels really familiar. I don't know why I feel so allured to this person. And if they don't text you back and they don't commit, your sense of self-worth is like handing your abandonment wound over to them. And then when they do show up, right, and this is intermittent, all of a sudden it gets more exciting. That's a setup. And that's something that you really need to look out for because anxious people need dependable, consistent, warm. In order to heal, it's much, much easier than hot and cold and the unavailable, the bad boy, but bad girl, but I, it's really unavailable type. Um, if you find yourself drawn to that, that's more about your history than um, you think. And that's something to explore within yourself because we need to be in safe relationships to have rupture and repair and to work through these issues. And so without a sense of safety, we're just going to be in sympathetic arousal. And that might be what our nervous system is used to. So if you date someone who's calm and consistent, it can feel very boring to your system because your system hasn't been in the presence of that enough to understand, wow, this is actually where intimacy gets built. This is actually um, a healthier situation where my, my wounding can come up and there can be a safer place for me to heal these patterns rather than just recreate them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And um, I feel, I, as I knew, lots of brilliant questions are already coming in and there's so much more I could ask you, but I do think it's important just to, to mention um, this point, which is that you can change, um, as you've said, you can work together to change and do the work, but ultimately, are there scenarios where you just have to admit defeat? Yeah, um, sure. I think the reason why I wrote this book for people in relationship and people who are single is because anxious people would always love to fix it. They always want to fix the relationship and I think um, part of what the anxious person needs to do is surrender to what is and tend to what's going on inside of them versus trying to fix the other person. It doesn't mean you can't understand them. Um, I talk about in chapter three, um, an avoidant person that might be a bad match is someone who literally doesn't need connection in the same way that you do, who 
you guys are living more in dysregulation than periods of connection because the wounding on both sides is so big. And then I go into narcissism. And, I, and I'm very, very careful with this word because it's been weaponized. And I think avoidant people have been weaponized too. But if someone doesn't have the capacity to have humility um, and their wounding is so big and the shame is there and they can't step into looking at their parts too. And it's always your fault. And there's this, you're like dealing with someone who doesn't self-reflect enough. It could be a very challenging relationship where you just keep giving and keep trying and over and over again, and you're just not going to get back into deep connection because they're so well protected within their defense mechanisms that they can't go to vulnerability. And there's so much shame there that if they were, it would feel intolerable for them. And so I try to build compassion, but also kind of like you're spinning your wheels. And so it's a really, it's hard. It's a hard thing to know, like, is this relationship one in which brings up my wounding where we can mutually heal? Or is this relationship so dysregulating on both sides that there's not a path back to connection? And that's a very sad thing to have happen because sometimes there's a lot of love there. And um, even if the person is narcissistic, I believe, or very, very avoidant, they can really love you to their capacity, but it might not be enough for them to do their own work to meet you in a place where you can get back into real intimacy and connection. And that takes a huge amount of vulnerability on both sides. So I explain that like as compassionately from a neuroscientific lens as I can, so that we're not weaponizing people, we're seeing the wounding, and we're having really honest conversations with ourselves, so that we're not setting ourselves up. Is everybody, do you think, and this word trauma um, and, you know, um, is used a lot more than perhaps it used to be um, used or used more widely, but do you think everybody has some element in their upbringing, in their childhood, in the way they formed attachments of this sort of trauma that they need to work through? Or does anybody come perfectly equipped to a relationship? I think people who had a more secure upbringing have an easier time. It doesn't mean they're not going to react when they partner with someone who's a, you're very anxious or avoidant, but they'll get back to homeostasis, a self-full place faster. Trauma is a hard word. And as I um, have worked with so many clients, when I talk about trauma, all of a sudden they're like, I don't have that. And really when I'm talking about trauma, I'm talking about interpersonal neurobiology. I'm talking about developmental trauma in the sense that when you were really small, little events impacted your body and system in a very big way. And so, yeah, it doesn't look like a rape and it doesn't look like your parents were intentionally doing anything to you, but there's still subtle impacts that do influence you. And so trauma is a tough word and I get a lot of pushback from that. But the truth is when you're two or when you're four and your parent forgets to pick you up from school and that happens over and over again, it imprints you. Or if you have a parent that struggled with substance abuse or you were told that you can't be angry or whatever it was, these all in, impact you. And the way in which we adapt is we shut down the parts that don't get us connection. And we live in the parts that we learn adaptively that do give us connection. And so sometimes when we get older, we haven't learned to kind of fully connect or become self-full in accepting the parts that we had to shut down in order to stay in connection. So these, the word trauma, it's a, when you were looking at developmental trauma, you really need to think of when you were one or two, your world was very small. Your collective world and the energy you grew up with is your paradigm. And the small, subtle things that happened in your world actually impacted you. And a lot of people are out of touch with that. And sometimes this shows up when you're in a romantic relationship and your partner picks up his phone or her phone or rolls his eyes or her eyes or disconnects from you and all of a sudden you're lit up. That's actually a very deep, normal response when we feel disconnected from our primary caregiver. So that's actually living in your body here and now. So I don't think people understand that. And then another thing I'd like to say is that we experience 
experiences and memories as experiences, but we also have something called implicit memories. And so when we're born, we don't have a fully developed hippocampus. So we store memory um, up until about 18 months. I think I could be wrong on that exact date, but we store original memory as sensation, not as memory. And so these sensations get stored in our body. And that's where, you know, all this trauma work and all this, you know, body keeps the score and all this stuff is showing you that this implicit sensational storage, we call it somatic work when we're meeting our body, is stored in our body first. And if you're in a relationship and someone hurts you and you're having an experience that is in your body, it is also old. 80% of it is pointing towards something you've experienced before. 20% of it is happening in the here and now. So it's information for you to hold what's being awakened rather than seeing as something's being triggered. Wow, my body's having this really big effect. This must have been in my history. This must have felt like what it felt like as a, bear, a baby. If it's unbearable, there's a good chance it's familiar and it's really, really old. I used to like to say, the more histrionic we are around it, the more history there is. So be gentle on yourself because your system is just reacting to fear in a sens sensational way because it's trying to protect you, in this case, from abandonment.